Saturday. We're going to be gone Saturday through, I think we'll come back the next Sunday. So I guess eight, eight nights or something. So, okay. yeah. So I'll, I'll tell the story on the podcast, but the reasons that you will probably do better are one, I got sunburned, so I was just uncomfortable. Right? Uh, two, two kids who were cold and like wanting to sleep right here. Like literally one, at one point I had one on each side. Like you're not gonna sleep well like that. Dogs who decide to bark at midnight, you know, stuff like that, that you won't have. Yeah. And then a windstorm okay. that was, ooh, an adventure. And I'll, yeah. I'll tell you about that. In a tent. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I look forward to hearing about that. It was, it was a <laughs> wild ride. <laughs> And welcome to Middleish, the podcast about moderation in all things. I am Aaron Green. And I am Michael Gray. How's it going, Aaron? Very good. Good. Very good. Very yes. good. That's very good. For I mean, for a Monday, that's it should be like rock star status, actually. Very good on a Monday is pretty dandy. Yeah. Yeah. That's about as much as you can ask for, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, I think I think part of it is that we are getting ready to go on a mountain bike trip. So, you know, the week before vacation can be really demanding and stressful, mm -hmm. but there's also kind of this um, anticipation that comes with it. Like just knowing yeah. that if I just get through the end of this week, man, we're do ready. Have, do you have senioritis a little bit? A little bit. It's yeah. it's been a while since Matt and I have been out of town. We yeah. the last trip we went on was October, so it's a bit. Yeah, it's been a and while. You're, you're going to be camping for nine days. Yeah, Ooh. I know. Yay. In our new camper, in our go fast camper setup, and Matt's been doing a lot of work getting it ready, and um, we're really excited to just test it out. And this will be a great trip just to make sure that we've got the, the major parts, you know, assembled the way we want and, mm -hmm. and installed and working and, um, to figure out like what other details are we forgetting that we need to build out. But yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. Weather looks like it's going to be great. St. George and hurricane okay. Southern Utah mountain biking. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. How fun. Excellent. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you just got back from we just got your back own from trip. camping. Yeah, it was spring break here last week, and we went to um, Garner State Park in Texas. It's about I don't know hour and a half maybe west of San Antonio. Uh -huh. um, it's gorgeous, lots of time in the river, floating in the river. Um, some really great hikes. Um, yeah, it was just a real good time. We had a lot of fun. Um, kids did great. Dogs did great. Sophie man, she's four and a half and she did like some over mile climbs that were like oh, steep, wow. like hands and feet for like adults scrambling huge steps. I'm, it, we were tired. It was, it was a tough mile ish. And she did it like a champ. Yeah. She did one on, we went up Monday. We did one on Tuesday. We got back and we're just like, Ooh, that was rough. And we're down there at the bottom and she's like, can we go on another hike? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a lot yeah, easier we'll for those, <laughs> those little bodies to pull themselves up onto those rocks. I was a rock climber in college and I remember mm. watching the little kids do some climbs that were really hard for me, but the way they could leverage their bodies and the way they could mm. just hold on to things and climb up the way I couldn't, I just, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you would think she would be exhausted, but if it's fun for her and she, she can it. scramble up there, that's yeah, cool. It was one of her favorite parts, um, doing that hiking. So we had a great time. It was, it was Good. some adventures, uh, the, we went up Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday night, uh, we had like this crazy windstorm and some rain. I mean, like it was some serious wind. And a lot of the people we, were, we went up with um, were kind of like, there was kind of a curve of the campgrounds and they were like blocked and we weren't, we were like exposed to the direction the wind was coming from. And literally our tent on one side was like folding over so far 
that the side was touching Kathleen while she was laying in her sleeping bag. Oh my gosh. And the tent pole snapped. Oh shoot. And then we have a canopy like over the front of our tent. <laughs> right. And it's like <laughs> falling in on us. So I'm outside like at four 30 in the morning, like I'm grabbing this canopy, like I'm a pirate, like trying to, you know, like steer the sail or whatever in the wind. And I'm just like trying to keep it from going over on us. You're Cause Captain if it gets Jack loose, Sparrow. right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get it from like going over on us and like falling on my family, trying to like rotate it just so it can like tumble off into the woods. Right. And Sophie's terrified. And at this oh, point, geez. the rain fly has like slipped because it's so strong. And so water is coming <laughs> into the tent. Oh no. Kathleen's sleeping bag is soaked. So I get the canopy like kind of moved over and it's like destroyed, like metal <laughs> joints broken metal bent like it's just ruined and we're like get in the car get out of the rain it's <laughs> like low 40s it's cold we're oh, wet man but we get in the car turn on the heat and we're just like okay let's just try to sleep here you know i guess um rain stops pretty quickly and the wind dies down and so i'm like well i'll go see if we have any dry sleeping bags or anything and there was enough room for the girls and i to sleep back at the tent and Kathleen slept in the car. Oh. And so the next morning I was, you know, running to the laundromat to get all kinds of stuff dry, sleeping bags and clothes and oh my gosh. That kind of stuff. It was at least there was a laundromat nearby. I mean, yeah, like really close. Can you imagine? I know, if right? You're yeah. really camping. Yeah. But it was <laughs> packing or something. But it was nice because you know, we were in the car, it's like five o'clock in the morning. We're all just like we're tired and cold and wet. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of frustrated because like, okay, well, there's our you know, those canopies are like 130 bucks or whatever. They're not cheap, it's just ruined, yeah. just I'm destroyed. And we were all just kind of like, you know, a couple days from now, we'll just be laughing about it. And this will <laughs> be one of those stories that when I'm old and have grandkids, we'll talk about that time we went camping. You know, like it was just like, okay, it's just gonna be one of those memories that was just kind of fun and crazy. And, My mom used to say yeah. that whenever shit would hit the fan when we were on family outings, which I mean, it happens, right? Like sure. road trips and yeah. camping and whatever. <laughs> And my mom would say things, you're going to laugh about this one. Oh, one day we're all going to laugh about this. And sure enough, there are many fond memories that we can think back. And at the time there was no humor found whatsoever, <laughs> but now we could laugh about it. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? It's done, but and it that was, happened at the beginning of your trip. That right? was Tuesday night. Oh, yep. rough and entry. Then, and then Wednesday night we didn't realize how cold it was. It got down to like 42 or 43 or mm -hmm. a tent, you know, and we were not dressed to sleep during that. So we're all waking up in the middle of the night, just like freezing cold, oh, no. putting on wool, you know, socks and hats and sweatshirts and stuff. But, but it was a blast and we had a great time. It was super fun. I got oh, sunburned. Yeah. It, yeah. First, first camping season trip. It's, yeah. It was a real good time. Sounds like you did girls, it right girls want to go back and we want to go back. And yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Good to get out of town. Good. Yeah. Good. So well, anyway, do you feel like uh, introducing today's topic? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> not well. Would you like me to <laughs> Michael yeah. is still on vacation. Let's everyone do an introduction today. <laughs> no. just... Yes, I will. Um, we're talking about a topic we've talked about a lot on many different episodes, but just kind of dive in a little bit deeper today on just the idea, the concept of mindful eating. What does it mean to eat mindfully? You know, what is mindfulness just kind of in general? And then how in particular does that play out with how we eat? Um, what are kind of the, the, the problems with not eating mindfully? Um, what is it? What isn't it? And that kind of stuff. Because it's a term I think that we hear a lot, um, you know, we talk about it on here. I, I talk about it, you know, on my own social media quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. It's, but I think to just kind of dive deep into what does it mean to eat mindfully? What does it pra mean to practice mindfulness while we're eating? And um, also just give you guys kind of some practical tools for doing that. Yeah. And we've talked about the concept of mindfulness on here before, mm -hmm. but as you said, you know, we haven't really like gone into mindful eating and mm -hmm. people who, I mean, we've talked about intuitive eating and a piece of intuitive eating is 
mindfulness and Absolutely. mindful eating. But I think people often conflate mindful eating with diet approaches. Right. Oh, it's a different and, diet. Yeah. <laughs> Is it like keto? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly right. Mindful keto. Oh, maybe do I lose Gwyneth on can. That? <laughs> maybe Gwyneth can twist this around for us, right? And do something she like absolutely mindful, can. mindful fasting. Wouldn't she come up with something like that? Yeah. What was the thing I sent Aaron something like a couple intuitive weeks ago? Intuitive fasting. Intuitive it's a book fasting, but also it was keto, right? It was like, oh, wasn't it the three I, things? Oh yeah, you're a ketotarian or something. Ketotarian and <laughs> intuitive fasting. Like, so this is not yeah. another diet approach, people. No, it's not another diet no. approach. And the reason I think it's important to go into this is mindful eating is something that you can practice anytime, anywhere. Once you develop the awareness and some of these skills, you have them for your lifetime and you can practice it in any situation. Um, and let's just appreciate for a moment how busy our lives are, especially when it comes to food in our lives. You know, we have, we have work, we have busy mornings. So breakfast isn't very mindful. We have snacking in the car or on the go, um, for athletes, there's a lot of, um, you know, eating to support your your activity. And so it's not always very mindful. We have right. social engagements, barbecues or parties. And so that's not very mindful. Mm -hmm. So, and we have of course devices and different right. things. So we're there's a lot TV of you while we eat or on our phone or yeah, exactly. So th there's so many things that interfere with the eating experience mm -hmm. and the concept of being mindful really is just drawing yourself into the present moment, just like we talked about mindfulness mm -hmm. is, but it is directly related to food. And we'll talk about right. some of the things to observe and think about as you are going through that eating experience yeah. mindfully. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, I, I, I really think that for most people, I think most people do not practice this. I think it's really mm. common that we don't eat mindfully, you know? Um, so if you're feeling like, oh, I don't do that. Like, don't worry. That's, that's most of us. I, I think right. we either don't develop that at a young age or, or we lose it. I'm not sure which it is, but I think for the average adult eating mindlessly, um, and not, you know, mindfully is pretty common. Um, and, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's such a important thing to do. You know, I think it, in a lot of ways, there's, there's a lot of just connecting with yourself, understanding yourself, listening to yourself, um, you know, just our relationship with food, all that kind of stuff. And it's really, it's what I love about addressing mindful eating, like with a client is it's pretty simple. It's not mm -hmm. this complex convoluted thing, you know, to begin to eat more mindfully, it's really straightforward and it's really simple and it's not that hard to establish, you know, um, it's, it's really pretty, I won't say easy, but it's, it's simple and yeah. it's, it's not, not easy. You know, I think a lot of times clients are surprised at how easy it is to go like, oh yeah, I'm just like really listening to my body and I know what it needs. And I, you know, I really enjoy eating mindfully because it enhances mm -hmm. the whole experience. And, and it's, it's just cool because it can really transform the way you eat and your relationship with food without being a real pain in the ass, right? Know, like a real this burden. overhaul. Mm -hmm. It's just not, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I, I want to read this little paragraph that I found in uh, one of the studies that describes mindfulness and, and mindful eating, but I just want to piggyback on something you just said that you don't know if we just don't develop it in childhood or if we lose it mm -hmm. at some point. So we talked about inviting kids into the kitchen and, right. and, you know, that was on a previous podcast and we're going to talk more about feeding kids and some of those principles that kids are very in tune with that mm -hmm. as adults, we've lost touch with those things. I have a theory that mindfulness is one of those things that we tend to lose touch with yeah. as we, as we have these external influences on right. our eating experience and our environment. Right. 
I think that we do tend to lose touch. I mean, think Mm -hmm. about kids. Like when you sit and eat with kids, they often will vocalize observations they're making about food. If it's hot, if it's cold, if this is round, if this is, look, this is a carrot. Oh, look, I see something else in here. And you, you know, they'll, they'll be very observant in the moment. And kids are also really excellent regulators. And we'll talk more about this in a later podcast, but just to kind of follow up on what you said, Michael, because I think it is a good point that you have these skills within you. This is something you know how to do. You knew how to do it when you were a kid or a baby even, but somewhere along the way, we, we kind of lost touch. So, so this, this paragraph, I think sums it up really well. Mindfulness is a process oriented rather than an outcome driven behavior. It is based on an individual's experience of the moment. The individual focuses on appreciating the experience of food and is not concerned with restricting intake. The person eating chooses what and how much to consume. It is not coincidental that within a mindful approach, the person's choices often are to eat less, savor more, and select foods consistent with the desirable health benefits. It's a good paragraph. So man, I mean, the first thing that stands out to me is that there's it's process oriented. Mm -hmm. It's not outcome driven. So you're not doing something right or wrong here. It's very much this observation awareness practice, Mm -hmm. and it's always a practice. It isn't like a test or a, a black and white way to look at things. It's very much like feeling the flow and observing and building awareness in the moment. Absolutely. And I think one of, you know, what a point that, that I knew I wanted to make before we even got on today and started recording and that, and that this echoes is that, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but that when we practice mindfulness, we often, let me say this, I guess, I think we tend to think that satisfaction is the result of eating a certain amount of quantity, Mm -hmm. a certain volume of food, right? But what I think we often find with mindfulness is that it's not just about that. Sure, to a degree, you know, I mean, if you mindfully eat a peanut, you're not going to feel full probably, right? Like you need to eat a certain amount. <laughs> but what, what happens is when we really experience all the range of senses that food taps into, you know, how it smells, how it tastes, the textures, and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, we, we start to find out the satisfaction has more to do with it, just volume. And it has to do with the experience. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had someone, um, like say ice cream, like if they like ice cream in the evening, you know, cool, have it, try this instead of four scoops, take two, do some of these mindful tech, mindfulness techniques that we're going to talk about, you know, and see how you feel. And Mm -hmm. all the time people are like, I felt so much more satisfied with so much less food, you know, like it really Mm -hmm. killed my craving a lot more than I thought it would because we're not taking food and saying, Oh, it's just this. It's also all these other things. And when we Mm -hmm. eat mindfully in a way where we experience food in the way it's supposed to be experienced, it's a lot more satisfying, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's just really cool how that works. Yeah. And it leads to, you know, the very final sentence that talks about, um, people often will choose to eat less, which Mm -hmm. we'll talk about that piece because some people think this is a diet approach It is not (laughs) savor more and select foods consistent with desirable health benefits. There is something really cool that happens when you show appreciation for a moment in your life, especially, I mean, hello, meaning in the mundane, Mm -hmm. how many times a day do we eat? Like Mm -hmm. for most people, it's, you know, four or five, six times a day, right? I know. I mean, depending. (laughs) (laughs) So, so if, if you just kind of passively go through these experiences And then you suddenly sort of force yourself to slow down and be present in the moment and to really savor it and be grateful and appreciate what is happening in your body. And, Mm -hmm. and this whole experience of eating, it can really change your perspective on what that experience is bringing to your life. And also it makes you kind of take pause and think about what you're 
putting into your body, how mm-hmm. you're treating your body, how your body feels during this experience. Mm-hmm. And I've done a ton of work with clients on this, where we really talk about, you know, the value of being mindful and just practicing it. This does not have to be practiced every eating experience of every day for the rest of your life. Right. You so don't have to go into this just all of a sudden <laughs> Zen Buddhist, you know, I can never to, eat with anybody again because right? I have to be mindful with every bite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't talk. Shh. Shh. So, so I, I think it's important to allow people to experience this and practice it, but then present it as an option. And I'm reminded of a client that I worked with years and years ago. I might've told this story on the podcast before, but I described the concept of mindful eating to her because she was finding that she would get home after work and she was so hungry. She wouldn't eat anything right after work, like a snack or whatever would be reasonable, but she would sit down to what she deemed was kind of a healthy food, like a big salad with some protein on it. And she would just hoover it. I mean, just literally pack it in and eat it. And then she was, she was telling me how hard it was to stick with this healthy eating because she didn't feel satisfied and you know, she's doing everything right, but then it backfires and she can't lose the weight. I mean, there were all of these things that she was telling me and I, and I just presented that option. What do you think about, you know, trying to practice some mindful eating? And I described the experience with, uh, we're going to go through the raisin meditation here in a second. (laughs) And I'll, I'll give you a, a hint of some of the ways I described it to her, but it was very much like this, you know, it's almost a spiritual kind of experience Mm -hmm. to some people, like the way it's described, it's a very Mm -hmm. sensual kind of, um, present and slow and methodical sort of thing. And she looked at me like I was from another planet or the loony bin. And she, she was like, what you're describing sounds like you expect me to hear angels sing (laughs) over my salad. And I said, well, I laughed, of course, you know, yeah, that's what it sounds like, but no, just think about some of these things next time you eat. And it took a few tries for her. And she came in one day and met with me and said, I get it now. I totally get it. And her experience was she really started observing how hungry she was going into that meal. So then that changed her behavior earlier in the day with being satisfied. She also appreciated different textures, flavors, things that we'll go over in a second you know, to appreciate during the food, um, during the eating experience. And she changed and kind of modified her outlook on that meal. So it wasn't like this prescribed, I have to eat salad and protein for dinner because that is the way she started appreciating that, oh, this doesn't quite satisfy the same way that other foods do. And she observed that and made changes accordingly. And she, Mm -hmm. it, it really did change her entire outlook on food. That's awesome. And that's the thing I love about this is a little bit goes a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's really common for people with just trying it a couple times, like maybe the first time it's like, oh, that was a different experience. Or within a couple of times, you'd be like, yeah, I can see how this is really beneficial because it it just, it's not the super complicated thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So do you want to talk about, we, we talked a little bit about what it is, which Mm -hmm. is being present in the moment, observing your body sensations. So the full sensory experience that's often talked about includes the taste of the food, texture, aroma, appearance, temperature, and then volume, as you Mm -hmm. alluded to earlier. So all of these things go into the eating experience. Very few people really sit down to a meal and think about all of these six things, taste, texture, aroma, appearance, temperature, and then the volume that they're eating. Right. And that can make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like to sum it up as just, I think mindful eating is it's paying attention, you know, yeah. it's, it's being mindful. It's paying attention to what's happening in all ways. And if you're watching TV or on your phone all the time, well, you're probably not paying attention. You know, um, Mm -hmm. if you're just woofing it down, well, you're probably not paying attention to, you know, how Mm -hmm. your, your body experiences food to what you're communicating to yourself, what your body's communicating to you, all these things, just paying attention. Um, Mm -hmm. because I think usually we don't at all, you know, we are, we're either doing something social or we're, we're distracted or we're just trying to get it in real quick. And there's this thing that is so critical 
I mean, eating, we got to do it. We have to do it to stay alive, right? Like it's a critical right. thing that we do. And we do it multiple times a day and we give it so little attention and so little, even value, right? Like I think a lot of people don't even value meals. They're just a thing that are kind of in the way that we have to do before we can do the other stuff. Yeah. And, and so just, just giving it the, the credit it deserves and just mm-hmm. paying attention is it's huge. You know? Yeah. And, and this is where I think also preparing the food comes into the mm-hmm. mindfulness practice too, and just understanding where it comes from and the process of putting it together, right. uh, which is why I will, if, if I have a client that's eating every meal is ordered in or is a convenience meal or a fast food meal, I'll start encouraging some of the process of actually making food. And it could be like the most simple thing. You could scramble eggs. You could, Mm -hmm. you know, make some peanut butter toast. I don't care, but let's just take a little bit more time to appreciate kind of where the food comes from and putting it together because that's part of the sensory experience too. smelling it cook or, you know, watching the, you know, the sauce pour on the noodles or whatever it is that is all part of this too. So, um, so I think that's important. And then just, as you said, reducing distractions, that's another, another thing about what is mindful eating, put down your phone, leave it in the other room, step away from your desk, um, turn off the TV. Again, this doesn't have to be done every single meal of every single day. And I mean, I think we both get that. I, I have, yeah, I, I, had I worked through lunch eaten. today. Like it's fine. Right. <laughs> right. There are some days when that happens. You know, I yeah. have I have been known to like take a bar in in my car when I'm driving somewhere just because I know timing wise mm-hmm. this this will set me up for a better outcome later, but mm-hmm. I will have an opportunity, you know, at dinner tonight to be more present and mindful. And I actually notice the difference when I do too much of that other that distracted eating or, you know, kind of hurried, rushed, get the job done. This is a pain in my ass. I don't even want to eat right now because it's pulling me away from the thing I need to be doing. I feel it when I don't have just a moment to just sit down and take a little break and appreciate food and nourishing my body. So I think that's a, that's a really important, um, observation for people to make. Yeah. We little sidetrack here. We, we, we did this uh, the girls, Lila and Sophie and I, we did this. And one of the practices we talk about in um, the kids in the kitchen episode. Oh. So they, they went to the store with me on, Friday, on Saturday. And um, I was like, all right, we're going to pick out something that we've never had before. Right. So let's do that. And oh, I love it. Sophie wasn't interested. She just wanted to get apples, which was fine. But Lila picked a dragon fruit. <laughs> oh, I was like, good. I don't, I think maybe I've had dragon fruit, but I'm, I don't think I have. If so, I haven't like ever cut one open. It was just mm-hmm. somewhere. Right. So we're like, it's really cool looking. Right. And so we get home and we're talking about it and looking at it and you know, like, where does it, what is it? I have no idea what it grows on. Let's <laughs> They're look it pretty up, funky right? looking. Like, yeah. Oh, it grows on cactus. That's cool. You know, um, just, just talking about it. And then I'm looking at, I'm like, I, I don't even know. Do you peel it? Do you cut? Like, how do you do it? Cause I've never had it either. Right. And so, you know, there's like cut it down the middle and just eat out of the, the skin. I'm like, okay, cool. So we cut it open and it opens and we're just like, oh my gosh, like this is the prettiest fruit I've ever seen, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the white and the black seeds and stuff. And we're talking about what it might taste like. And is it going to be sweet or tart? you know, and, and so we're, we're doing this, we're, we're, we're really in the moment with this food. Mm -hmm. And so we all get a spoon and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to take a bite. We can't judge it by the first taste, right? Like we got to let it sit in our mouths for a bit. Got to let it sit, chew a little bit. If you want to spit it out eventually, that's fine if you don't like it, but let it sit for a minute. Like let's really (laughs) taste this as opposed to just mm, add, judge it. And so, you know, the three of us, we took a bite and Sophie instantly was like, I said, no, no, wait, 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 wait. I said, just wait a minute. Just taste it. She kind of sat there for a minute. (laughs) But But she tried. She tried it. Yeah. And, um, and Lila and I were both just like, this is really pretty good, you know, and it, 
it was such a different experience doing all of that beforehand that wasn't even part of the actual eating, right? Than just cutting it open, hey, try this, you know? And it was, it was this together experience. It was really just knowing where this food had come from, you know, what we might experience talking about, it was just a whole different thing. And so when we tried it, we were very dialed into that experience of tasting Mm -hmm. it. You know, it wasn't just a, oh, Hey, here, try this, you know, while you're on your phone or distracted or someone's talking to you and uh, whatever, it's fine. You know, so we really got to experience the full flavor of it. And then we talked about like, we, we really savored it for a minute. Like, don't, don't spit it out. Don't swallow it. Just let it sit. What uh-huh. do you taste? What does it remind you of? What do you think about all those seeds? You know? And so it was just, it was a really good illustration of what we're talking about. Just a cool experience too, where you just mm-hmm. become really connected in that moment and just sort of very aware of, of what you're doing, you know? And I think that's the beauty of mindful eating. Well, and I love that story because how often do you actually let food sit in your mouth and really taste Mm -hmm. it and observe what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of scary with a new food. And so I don't know many adults that do that, but then even a food that you really appreciate and, and enjoy eating, I don't know that there are many people that really just let the food. I mean, sure. There's, if there's a food that requires, requires a lot of chewing, then that Mm -hmm. food is in your mouth a little bit more and you get a little more flavor experience, but foods that can just kind of be, you know, consumed rapidly. Um, I don't know that we are used to holding them in our, our mouths longer. And this is, (laughs) yeah, this, this is, I think this might be a good place to talk about the raisin meditation. Let's do the raisin meditation. So the raisin meditation is, uh, it I'll, I'll read through some of these things. It's quite long, but I will make sure to post a link to it in the show notes. The raisin meditation was brought into practice from John Kabat-Zinn, who is a professor emeritus um, over at the Massachusetts Medical School. And he is the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction. So he, he really is a pioneer in this area and came up with the raisin meditation. And essentially the raisin meditation, this is where we kind of get into that like spiritual experience because it is eight steps, eight Eight steps, steps. how to eat a raisin in eight steps. Honestly, (laughs) honestly, you don't get to actually put the raisin in your mouth until step five. So, so it's very much like using all of the senses. And the first thing is holding the raisin in a certain way, gazing at it, seeing the raisin, letting your eyes explore every part of it, the dark hollows, folds and ridges, Let the raisin asymmetries, see you. <laughs> right? You become one with the raisin. And I, you know, sometimes I read through this and I'm like, man, it's like the raisin is this mountainscape. And like my imagination runs away, my imagination runs away with me, but you can, and then he talks about touching the reason, like turning it over in your fingers, feeling the texture of it, um, maybe squeeze it a little bit and see kind of what that feels like. So you truly are, I mean, you are really observing this raisin with mm-hmm. everything. Smell the raisin. I mean, anybody who's opened a box of raisins knows that they smell, mm-hmm. but how often would you really <laughs> take the time to smell a raisin, you know, take a whiff of those raisins. <laughs> So, so it, it, and one of the things, this is one of the, um, aspects that he puts in here, as you do this, notice anything interesting that may be happening in your mouth or stomach. Mm -hmm. So when I was in school for dietetics, I remember learning about the process of digestion and the first time that I actually realized, I mean, we we all know about like your mouth watering, right? I mean, we've seen it in cartoons growing up where you hear that term mouth watering, Mm -hmm. but to truly observe it and to understand that that is actually your body's response to the anticipation of being fed. And then from a physiological understanding of how that contributes to digestion is really it, to me, it was like this epiphany, like, mm. oh, all of a sudden you're 
just in tune with your body's natural responses to the anticipation of food Mm -hmm. and notice that smells do this, seeing food, um, thinking about eating. Like we did a visualization exercise where we closed our eyes and our uh, professor just described a food to us. And then she, and she, we didn't know that we were talking about like the mouthwatering effect or whatever's going on in our stomach. And then she asked us kind of in the middle of her explanation, what do you notice is happening in your body? And everybody in the classroom was like, oh yeah, you know, there's all kinds of things happening. So that's part of this, which is just Mm -hmm. noticing, okay, what are my body cues that are contributing to this too? Yeah. Um, now slowly bring the raisin to your lips. (laughs) Slowly. Give it a kiss. It's, it's like, I mean, it's describing like, notice how your hand and arm know exactly how to bring the food to mm. your mouth and um, place the raisin in your mouth and then roll it around in your mouth and explore it with your tongue. And, you know, there's all kinds of steps to this. It is far more than just eating a raisin. Yeah. Yeah. I really feel like what we should have done is have you go through these steps and I could have a raisin and do all these steps as you're describing them, that would have been fun. Well, next time, next Next time time. we could do, we, well, do you have a raisin in the house? I can hold this down while you go and grab a raisin. I might be fresh out of raisins or something else. I don't don't know. We, have any we invite our listeners <laughs> to practice this. And if you want us to do a follow-up and read through the raisin meditation and just simply do a raisin meditation on the air, that could be a request. We could do yeah, that. We could do that. Yeah. <laughs> but then you go into tasting it and swallowing it and just noticing the changes that are happening as this raisin is in your mouth. So this reminds me of the dragon fruit story mm-hmm. that you just told where uh, uh, we're holding it in our mouths mm-hmm. for a little bit, you know, we're she not just like it. gulping it down or spitting it right. out. So this raisin meditation does the same thing. And then finally feel what it's like for the raisin to go down your throat, to slide down, the raisin is no longer in your mouth, but what, what remains in your mouth, what flavors or sensations remain in your mouth. And so it really is like, I mean, geez, that took me, you know, five minutes, just giving you guys the highlights of it. But the whole practice is very much Mm -hmm. a meditation to practice. So, well, and I think it's, I mean, I I think it's easy to, to hear this and kind of I mean, we're laughing about it and joking about it because it's like super complex, <laughs> but at the same time, and maybe not to this degree, maybe, but I think it's, it's really interesting to do this sometimes, you know, to really like really take a minute and really experience a food because the thing about, I mean, if you're talking about like a Twinkie or chips or something like, yeah, they're consistent, you know what you're going to get. They're not complex, right? Like they, they're pretty straightforward, but more natural foods, I think they often have a lot of complexity. And sometimes it's like the thing you taste in five seconds isn't what you tasted at one second, Mm -hmm. right? It can change. And, and the textures, like they're talking about the raisins and the folds and the valleys and that kind of stuff. You know what textures of foods change how we experience taste and satisfaction and the whole thing. And so I think it's, it can be really cool sometimes to, do this with food. And, and I, I think we naturally do this sometimes, like if we f- get something really decadent, right? Like we sure. put a spoonful and it's, mm, mm, you know, we just like automatically, wow, this is good. Let me just take a second. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's not uncommon, but we, I guess we assume <laughs> that just everyday food can't have that experience. And I think we're off the wrong. Yeah. Because it really can, if we just take a minute and, and really experience it. And then it gets easier to sort of like experience food in different ways. You know, we mm-hmm. start to become of without taking, you know, 10 minutes to go through an eight step process. We just, we notice texture, we notice mm-hmm. taste and aftertaste, you know, we just, we experience it, the smells and that kind of stuff and how our mouth waters before, just because we're thinking about it when we see it or when we smell it. And just sort of honoring this really cool process that is happening, even if we're not paying attention, you know, it's this really Mm -hmm. cool process that the body goes through to prepare for digestion and and all that stuff. And um, I think it can just be really worthwhile to do sometimes. Yeah. 
And one of the key reasons why mindful eating is promoted is to improve one's relationship with the food. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you force yourself to just pause and think about the food a little more and observe what you're actually sensing with that food, it also causes you to sort of reframe the story you tell yourself about that food. So there's, there's some evidence that, uh, people who have diabetes will have better blood sugar control. They will have weight loss. They will have, you know, improved biological metrics just from practicing mindful eating. It Mm. could be the exact same foods they have been eating, but just the practice of mindfulness has improved them. Well, there's further research being conducted on this. You know, why is that? Like, what is it about this mindfulness practice? And some of the theories are that, well, you know, you, maybe you appreciate the food more, you know, you're not feeling if it's a quote healthy food and you have felt like you've been forced to eat this food. And so you're not really into it. Practicing mindfulness shifts your appreciation for that food Mm -hmm. and causes you to kind of tell yourself a different story and to start observing things, maybe in a more pleasant light. Um, and maybe tuning into how your body feels as you eat that food, which could be a more pleasant experience. And then the same can happen with, like you said, a really decadent food. I've had people that actually realize that they don't really like a food that they had been kind of programmed to believe is super decadent and desirable. And I need to eat this Mm -hmm. whenever it's available to me because it's just there. But then when they become mindful about it and they really are observing what's happening, they're like, you know, this just isn't. And I, I have had that happen, um, personally. And so I, Mm -hmm. I realized like, man, this food just is not doing it for me. And so you set that donut or whatever the decadent food is down and people think you're nuts because why wouldn't you eat that amazing food when it's available? But if it's not hitting the mark for you, then don't eat it. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I've seen that happen with myself, with clients a lot with like highly processed foods. Mm-hmm. Like when you slow down with it, it's like, oh, it kind of tastes fake, <laughs> you know, right. like it doesn't, if I let it sit in my mouth for a minute, if I just swallow it real quick, like, Ooh, you know, a Twinkie or whatever, like, mm, that was good. But if you really just sit with it a minute, it's like, you know, <laughs> this isn't Isn't really doing what I thought it was going to do. You know, Mm -hmm. I feel like I've seen that a lot. And to your point, like I, I have, I'm going to use the example of broccoli, right? So when I was a kid, I hated broccoli. Like my mom has joked through my whole life that she said, we could have sold tickets to people (laughs) to watch you eat broccoli. You put on such a show (laughs) whenever, you know, because I, I just hated it. And I felt like I was going to puke and just maybe ugh, we should have you do the, the broccoli meditation. Well, I will now, but here's the thing <laughs> is we eat it on a very regular basis now and I don't love it, but I'm absolutely fine eating a big old mess of it, you know, and it took me some time to figure out why. And it was never about the taste. It was about the texture, the, mm. the little tops. Yep. I, as a kid, I felt like it, I had a mouthful of hair. That's what it felt oh, like. Geez. And it just felt <laughs> like it, in my head, it was like this big ball of hair. You know what I mean? Ah, and it just, yeah, it felt nasty. And, and it, I don't even know that I processed the taste because it was just this ugh, mm-hmm. experience. Your perception was just there. Yeah. Like it was in your head that this yeah. is just like, gross. I don't like this texture. And I, I didn't realize that's what it was. I just hated broccoli. But as I got older, you know, I, I, I kind of like spent a little more time with it and kind of like, I don't like, why do so many people love broccoli and I hate it. And I learned, I, I actually kind of like the taste. It's just the texture that was an issue. Mm-hmm. And once I, once I realized that it made the texture, not as much of a problem because I could kind of enjoy the taste more, you know, I was like, I actually kind of like this taste. And so I've spent some time to kind of try to figure that out. It's like, okay, so if I kind of like this taste, can I get past the texture to enjoy this taste that I kind of like? And I'm at the, it took, took a while. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't like an easy thing, but, (laughs) but it's like when we have broccoli, I, I I happily eat a lot of it, you know, because I figured out what the problem was and it's helped me enjoy this food even more because I can Mm kind of go like, okay, I know what to expect. 
and that I'm not going to like, but I also know what to expect that I'm going to like, because I spent some time paying attention to it. You know, I think a lot of times we discount foods because of maybe a taste, just, just a taste or just a texture, or just this one thing, but there may be some other things that you really like about that food. If you just spend some time with it. And I think that's why mindfulness, mindful eating as an observation and a process oriented mm-hmm. approach can be like really experiment. helpful. Yeah. 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 Let's just see, see let's see, see what I like about this or what I don't like about this and observe it. And just as you said, there could be one aspect about that food that is like, okay, this, you know, I prefer, it doesn't hit all the marks for me. I wish this was, you know, maybe a little bit crunchier, or I, you know, I really don't like this piece of the food. So I'm going to cut that piece off or I'm whatever, I'm going to eat that first. And so then I can enjoy the rest. I mean, however you decide your relationship with that food is going to be. And I know for some people, they're going to hear us talk about that whole food relationship thing and probably think that we're, you know, maybe blowing this out of proportion a little bit or, or thinking too much on it, or man, it is just eating. It's just food. Like just get the job done. That's cool. If that works for you and you're one of those, like, I would say sort of programmable eaters where you can Mm -hmm. literally just eat very similar foods day in and day out at the same times. And it works for you and you're getting the nutrition you need, man, go for it. The vast majority of people that I work with are not programmable eaters. No, There are a lot of things that go into our relationship with food and our history with food and how we eat throughout our day. And then as our bodies age, and as we, you know, engage in, different activities, or we, I don't know, get a new diagnosis or we get families or we get a different job. And there's a lot of things that can impact how we eat and why we eat the way we do. And if you're not sort of in touch with some of the influences on that process, I think it can really throw people for a loop. And that's, that's where we run into some of these health problems or, you know, food relationship problems, whether it's, you know, disordered eating or a relationship with your body you don't like, or any of these other things. So that's why we're, we're talking about this, why it's such an important topic. Right. And I think, you know, if you, if you try to increase your mindfulness while you're eating or, and it, and it feels uncomfortable, or if the idea of this feels uncomfortable, I think it's really good to ask yourself why. Mm-hmm. Why, why would paying attention, just a little bit more attention to what is happening while I'm eating? Why would that be discomforting? Because I think for a lot of us, if we get into mindfulness a little bit, there's a lot of other things that are going to come up that we don't really want to address, you know, like our relationship with food or the things we tell ourselves, how we use food to cope with old wounds or emotional stuff, you know, whatever, it can really expose a lot of things sometimes. Um, So I think if there is some discomfort there, there may be a reason that that discomfort is there. If you're feeling like, "Mm, I don't know if I want to do this, there might be a reason. Um, Mm -hmm. But I do think that oftentimes beginning to practice mindful uh, eating is some really good first steps to seriously overhauling your relationship with food, how you interact with it, the things you tell yourselves while you're eating, what you're do and don't deserve, what you're, I mean, it really can be, I don't want to be like grandiose here, but it really can be sort of like the building block or a stepping stone towards really addressing a lot of things that get in the way that you may not even be aware of that are keeping you from taking really good care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And since we've talked so much about the practice of mindful eating and what it is, let's just clarify what it is not. not, So we've, we've already talked about, it is not a requirement. You don't have to suddenly embark on this mindful eating journey where everything is like Mm -hmm. distraction free and with the proper setting and utensils and you know, that that's not the goal here. The goal is to 
make it a priority when you can. And if you find that your life is so hectic and chaotic that you never get a chance to be a mindful eater, well, then that should probably be prioritized just to practice it and give yourself that space. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, I will add that when you are amped all the time and your, your brain is going and stressed out, if you don't take a moment to just chill out and appreciate your, your physical needs and nutrition is one of those, then we're looking at some other, you know, issues there. So if you don't have time to mindfully once in a while, (laughs) that's a whole other issue. We're having a problem. So it's not an everyday requirement, but, but make it a priority. It is not a diet tool. Mm -hmm. And it's very unfortunate that people have taken the practice of intuitive eating or mindful eating and spun it into this magical, you know, diet weight loss method tool. or yeah. path. Yeah. yeah. Come on. It is a practice. We've already been through, you know, all of the, we've described why it is a process oriented kind of practice and not an outcome oriented practice. Right. So don't turn it into a diet tool. Don't turn it into, you know, another thing is drinking water. I mean, yes, one of the mindful eating um, steps is to put down your fork in between bites. Mm -hmm. And this is really everything Michael and I just talked about, you know, tasting the food, appreciating the textures, letting it sit in your mouth a little longer, slowing your pace of eating. So you can Mm -hmm. actually be present with this meal. Sure. Putting down your fork or spoon or taking a sip of water or wine or whatever you have with your meal do that, but don't do it with the intention of if I drink this full 12 (laughs) ounce tumbler of water water with my, with my meal, then I'm not going to eat as much. Mm -hmm. That's diet mentality. We don't want that. Similarly, you know, I've heard about trying a smaller plate for, for mindful eating. And the Mm -hmm. idea is there's less temptation to power through a small portion of food than to just make it last and kind of stretch the time a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I could see how that's a reasonable approach Mm -hmm. at the same time, trying to quote, trick yourself into eating less because of a smaller plate. Again, are you focusing on this outcome of weight loss and dietary restriction, or are you really focused on the practice of eating mindfully? Mm -hmm. In fact, I had a client just this last week who experienced the opposite where she, she actually took a portion for her lunch that was larger than she had intended. And she was like, Oh, I took, you know, it's like when you're grabbing the containers out of the fridge and you grab whatever the, the bigger portion instead of your mm-hmm. lunch portion. And she was like, Oh, that's a lot of food. She just started eating it and just paid attention. And when she was satisfied and kind of lost interest in the food, she put it away and, mm-hmm. you know, could finish it at a later time. So mm-hmm. things like that, you know, it can work both ways. You could start Mm -hmm. with a smaller portion. You can always go back for more. You can start with a larger portion and then just stop when you're satisfied. So it is not a diet tool. Nope. And you know, one thing I like about the smaller portion too, is I I think it needs to be used wisely. I think it needs to be, you know, for some people it'll probably be wildly inappropriate. Again, it depends on the person, but one thing I do like about it is it does give the opportunity to eat some food and then sit. Like if I have someone eat from a smaller plate, it's not just eat from a smaller plate. It's eat from a smaller plate. Wait 10 minutes. Listen to your body. Are you still hungry? If you're Mm -hmm. still hungry, get more food, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's a tool to sort of like, okay, give your, give your body some food and see what it's telling you to begin to understand, like connect with, am I full? Am I still hungry? What am I experiencing? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. I think it can be good to use it um, in that way. I also like um, a tool just to like set a timer, like say 15 mm-hmm. minutes and make your meal last that long or 20 yeah. minutes. Don't finish <laughs> 15, your last bite. 15 is not that long, but man. It's not, but you tell people I know, that I and they're like, Hoover what? <laughs> I'm done in three. Like, I know that's yeah. part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you set a timer and say, okay, don't take your last bite until that time, make it stretch it out because a lot of mindfulness is slowing down. It's hard to experience anything, whether it's taste or textures, whether it's, um, you know, how much you enjoy it, whether it's what your body's telling you, you know, fullness cues, it's hard to experience any of that. If we rush through it, you really don't give your body a chance to tell you anything. So I think a lot of mindfulness is slowing down. So there's an opportunity 
to one, pay attention in the first place, and then receive all those messages and understand what, what's really happening here. You know, what do I do? I not like what, what, you know, when am I full? When am I still hungry? What do those feel like? All that kind of stuff. If we slow mm-hmm. things down a bit, um, it gives you a chance to, to actually do that. Yep. Yeah. So we will put the raisin meditation in the show notes for anybody that wants to practice that. If you practice that, please email us. I would love to hear about your experience. I really, really <laughs> we, would. We really should have had you do this on the air, but we, we also had a lot of other things to cover. I feel like that could have taken up the whole episode with the yeah, I probably would have jokes and punchlines. Yeah. yeah. No, you would have been fine. You'd have been fine. <laughs> That's a lot of faith you're putting in me. <laughs> uh, well, we already heard about one of your fun escapades this last week, but any further meaning in the mundane you want to share? Actually from kind of, uh, comes out of that crazy windy night we had. So the next day, and we were all tired, you know, it was, Mm. the wind was blowing hard before our tent was collapsing. It was blowing hard and we were up like, it was just, it was loud and wild. Um, and the next day, um, yeah, we were just all tired. And I think I was holding Sophie or sitting with her or something. And she said, daddy, I want that windstorm to happen again tonight. <laughs> oh, I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? I said, do you want it to happen again? She's like, yeah. And I was like, why do you want it to happen again? And I can't remember exactly what she said, but we kind of went back and forth a little bit and we got to the place where, so it happened. We went to the car, right? The girls and I, went back in the tent and they were both in one arm, like sleeping, right? I wasn't sleeping. They were sleeping. (laughs) And the way we had things set up, we had two like two thin, like kind of double sized mattresses. And Lila and I were sleeping on one and Sophie and Kathleen were sleeping on another. And um, she's, so what it came to was when we went back in, she got to snuggle up right against me, right in the crook of my arm and be held close. And she felt safe and comforted and that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was, I want to do that again. Like I want to be snuggled right up to you and held close again, which I mean, we do all the time, but for whatever reason, this was a big deal to her. So I was like, okay, so tonight, do you want to sleep on the same mattress as daddy? And she's like, Oh, cute. so it's just really cute how like it we meant, don't need to relive know, the cyclone right? kid you can switch <laughs> but like it meant so much to her that her mind was like okay that was worth it being terrified because she was scared out of her mind <laughs> right like it was it was scary for her but it was worth it because i really got to do this thing that i want to do and that was just like as a no. dad i'm like oh my gosh yeah it was a That's really meaningful sweet. moment yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that. And there is something, um, extra special about that comfort and safety that comes after a scary experience. Mm-hmm. So I could see how she would associate those two things. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Well, fun. Felt pretty good. good. I honestly have like 15 more from the last week. Cause it was just a great week. <laughs> Write but... them down. You can always know, draw right? from them at a later time. <laughs> yeah. Remember that camping trip I took in 2021? Well, here <laughs> is one of <laughs> I don't need any more experiences for the rest of the year. Yeah. The rest of 2021 will just be from the camping trip. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So how about you? Well, we have had some really nice spring weather recently. And for those listeners who have been following all along, I had started really getting into mountain biking last spring with my husband and mm-hmm. just thinking about how far I have come in the year that I've been really working on mountain biking, um, has been going out riding this spring. It has just been so much more enjoyable to me. Whereas I can remember going out a few times last spring and kind of having to, okay, like this is the part in the trail that you get a little bit nervous and you're not real sure about this little technical thing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if I went without Matt, I would be a little bit like, you know, unsure, like there's just, I don't know this trail very well or whatever. And I have gone out numerous times on our little, the loop we do from home. It's like this 11 mile loop. And I'm just having the time of my life. I mean, really like, 
enjoying, I have a new bike that does help. <clears throat> However, I will say that my mind is just in a very different place where I am anticipating it and enjoying it and just loving being out there. And this loop we do, I mean, shit, we, we do it at least every week when the trails mm -hmm. are in good shape, when we don't have rain, but we'll do it multiple times a week. It's a, it's a natural connection from other trails. And so we'll often just finish with that trail. And you would think that it would just kind of get mundane and boring and you know, that again, but I just, I'm ha literally having the time of my life. And it's yeah. been a year that I've been riding the loop <laughs> and, um, it's really fun to get back out there. You know, we've been on a, a riding hiatus because of winter. And, um, now that it's here, I'm just, I'm loving it. It was great last week to just get out and ride this, the That's same awesome. thing that I rode all last year. So That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. And I think it's just, it just, it's such a cool thing that illustrates that like your comfort level and confidence in yourself. Like, I don't need that. I'm fine. I got this. Yeah. And how like, you know, when we first start something new, yeah, it's, it's easy to feel like you got to rely on someone or you're worried, you know, things are not going to go, but the more you do it, the more consistent you are. And we build that confidence in ourselves and that trust with ourselves. And it's like, I got this. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's good. Very so, fun. um, thank you everybody for listening mm -hmm. and watching and, um, you can check us out on, uh, Instagram. We're at middleish underscore podcast and send us an email middleish at gmail.com. You can support our podcast in the show notes. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Share rate review, all that stuff. Um, we'd love to, you know, spread the message of middleish to a broader population. And, um, a big part of that honestly comes from you guys just sharing it with your followers and that kind of stuff. So we always very much appreciate when you take a chance to do that. Yep. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye-bye.